In today's rapidly changing world, we all have questions and we all want answers. It's on this program that we get our answers from the Word of God. It's time for another episode of A Relevant Word with longtime pastor and best selling author Carl Gallup. Welcome to another A Relevant Word with Pastor Carl Gallops of the Pensacola, Florida area. I'm Kevin King, and Carl and I were just discussing what the show today is going to be about. And not only do I believe that you're going to get a blessing out of this, I believe that we are all going to learn something about one of the mysteries of the Bible. There's lots of mysteries in the Bible, yeah. and someday we'll find out the, the answers. Yeah, I've, but, got, I've got all the answers. There's no more but, mysteries for me. Well, well, hopefully you can <laughs> shed a relevant word on one of the big ones, which is in Second Thessalonians yeah. in chapter 2. Yes. yes. Carl? Yeah, thank you. I appreciate it, Kevin. And of course... I was being sarcastic. Yeah. I, there are still mysteries that I, God is showing me and those that have yet to be uncovered. Even when you think you know Even it, you with, see it a different way yeah, years yeah, later. Yeah, yeah, and that has happened a few yeah. times over the years, yes. And, you know, being in one church for a long time, um, it, it calls into question your integrity of whether or not you'll admit it. Mm. You know? So I have had to it's go. Like, preacher, I remember uh, this yeah, is not what you told right. us 25 years that's ago. That's right. And see, I know they remember that. So that's why I go to the church, you know, tail between my legs and say, listen, I want to take you a little deeper now as the Lord has revealed this to me, et cetera, et cetera. Okay, just trying to be a man of integrity. So, no, of course, I don't know everything. Don't even come close to know everything. But the things that I do know, I try to show them contextually. Let the Word of God interpret itself clearly. This is going to be one of those things. But I can tell you, uh, we're calling this, I think, the, the mystery of Second Thessalonians, chapter 2. And But I can tell you that that the mystery surrounding th- these particular couple of verses, um, they're, they're, they're quite a d- a divisive among God's people all over the world as to how they interpret it. But I'm just going to say to you, number one, I really believe, and I think, I think you'll believe this by the time it's over. I'm not putting words in you uh, for, for listening, but I think you'll agree with me that, that the pro- one of the problems is that we're reading English texts well, but the words are written in Greek. And, and there are even some Aramaic words in the New Testament. So, uh, and those Greek words have Hebrew equivalents that help to define the words. So there's that. But not only that, when we see the particular words we're going to look at today, you're going to realize, and I'm going to show you, you're going to hear them. And you might want a piece of paper and pencil because I'm going to give you the references and then I'm just going to start reading them. So you can jot them down and go see for yourself. But now... We, we we will hear the word of God actually define the meaning of the words. So by the time we get to Second Thessalonians chapter two, the word is defined. In fact, the apostle Paul says, "Listen, I've written this to you before. You should know this." I mean, he chastises them because there's discord in the church back then about the interpretation. Of course, remember, it's coming to us in English from the Greek, but more than likely a lot of this was spoken in Aramaic or Hebrew by the people. You know, Paul knew Aramaic and Hebrew, and he was a Hebrew guy. So so there's two or three different language translation issues here. But once we get down to the contextual Word of God and we see what the Word of God says, we have a huge aha moment. So that's where we're going to go today. You ready, man? You strapped in? I want to know what the mystery is, Carl. Yeah, that's good. Well, you're getting ready to find out. <laughs> but anyway, folks, listen. So I'm, I, I'm going to start, with, of course, with 2 Thessalonians chapter 2. It's the mystery of 2 Thessalonians chapter 2, the first four verses. And we're really going to focus in on that, uh, that fourth verse. But it says, so, so concerning the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ and our being gathered to him, we ask you, brothers and sisters, not to become easily unsettled or alarmed by some prophecy or report or some letter supposed to have come from us, and what Paul means is him, <laughs> saying that the, the, quote, day of the Lord is already come. Don't let anyone deceive you in any way, for that day will not come until the, some translation says, rebellion occurs. Some translation says the, when the apostasy occurs. Those words are correct, but they're in English from the Greek, but it won't come until the apostasy occurs or the rebellion occurs. And the man of lawlessness is revealed. That's a term for the Antichrist, 
The word antichrist is only used in the book of First John. A lot of people don't know that. They think it's all through the book of Revelation. It's all through the New Testament. They think Jesus used that term. No, they use different terms, mainly the man of lawlessness, the son of perdition, things like that. So here in Second Thessalonians, Paul says, so that day will not come until the man of lawlessness, that will be the antichrist, and his system is revealed. He is the man doomed to destruction. He will oppose and will exalt himself over everything that is called God or is worshipped so that he sets himself up in God's temple proclaiming himself to be God. There you go. There's the verse. He sets himself up in God's temple. Now that's interesting. There is no temple on the Temple Mount. Well, of course, people will look at that and say, well, yeah, it's been 2,000 years. It was torn down starting around 70 AD with the Romans. It took them oh, 20 or 30 years to complete the whole task, ran the Jews out of the area, tore the temple down. It was just this huge uh, uh, desecration as far as the Jewish people were concerned, and it has never been rebuilt, So, which causes a whole body now, Kevin, of modern-day theology to presume or assume that, well, that means in the last days there's got to be a rebuilt temple. And then they go on to say, and that's where the Antichrist is going to set himself up because Second Thessalonians 2 says that. Right here, the man of lawlessness will set himself up in the temple. When Paul writes this, there's still a temple there. So you would think, well, that's what Paul meant. But but it was torn down. Paul died in 67 AD. The temple was torn down in 70 AD. Well, didn't Paul know that? I'm convinced he did know that was going to happen. How would he know that? Because Paul gives his own testimony earlier in the scriptures that he was caught up to paradise and saw the things of the end. For some things he wasn't permitted to tell, but some things he was. He's the one that talks about the mystery of the rapture. Behold, at the last trumpet, we'll all be caught up together in the air with him. He's the one that tells this about the man of lawlessness, setting himself up, proclaiming to be God. He's the one that talks about the outpouring of demonic activity. Uh, there will be doctrines of demons in the last days. The Spirit clearly says in the last days, and he goes on to tell. So yeah, he saw it. I'm sure God showed it to him, but he was not permitted to speak of that yet because God was giving it in pieces as it unfolded, lest he panic his people and tell them the future like a crystal ball. No, the Word of God's not meant that way. But the Word of God is built in such a way that when things happen, we go back and look at it, and we say, oh my gosh, it was there all along. We just didn't understand. We didn't, we didn't uh, uh, translate it correctly, or we didn't read the rest of the scriptures that talked about that. That's context. And we just pulled a verse or two out and thought we had it all figured out, and that's what we taught and what we preached. And then you find out later that was incorrect. Okay, So the scriptures are, are done that way on purpose because we're told to study to show ourselves approved, able to accurately handle the Word of God, and the Holy Spirit has to guide us. Also, we're told in the Word that the demonic realm, Satan himself, is not supposed to be able to discern all the details. First Corinthians chapter 2, even the crucifixion. It said, but had the rulers of this age known, they would not have crucified the Son of God. Why is that? Because the crucifixion was the death nail for Satan and his kingdom. But who was it that thought he put Jesus on the cross? It was Satan. The Bible says he filled Judas. He entered into Judas. Jesus says that. And then got him on the cross. Satan thought he was destroying Jesus when the whole thing was a setup from the beginning from the throne of God. And after it was over, Satan went, oh my gosh, I missed that. Well, of course, he doesn't have the Holy Spirit. He doesn't approach the scriptures the same way we do. But when it was all done, Peter writes in First and Second Peter, he slaps his forehead almost. He says, now we have the word of the prophets made more certain. It's happened in our lifetime. Now we see it. Oh my gosh, it was there all along. Well, folks, I'm telling you, Second Thessalonians is just like that. I'm going to set it up. And let me set it up right now, and then we'll wrap it up in the next segment. But right now, listen to this. So 2 Thessalonians, just stick with that verse 4, and he's telling about the last days. Paul is the most widely known rabbi in history. To this day, there are 8 billion people on the planet. Some 3 billion claim to be Christians out of all the denominations. That means at least 3 billion people know who the Apostle Paul is. He wrote half the New Testament documents. No other rabbi in the world has that kind of uh, acclaim and has done that kind of work for the kingdom work for over 2,000 years. People are continually saved through the words and through the inspiration of Paul's uh, scripture. So that's who wrote what I'm getting ready to show you. But this guy, 
he is the one that wrote Second Thessalonians 2. And then he, the next couple of verses, he said, I shouldn't have to tell you this. I've told you this before. I've written it. I've preached it. I've taught you this. So what is he talking about? That the Spirit says in the last days, the man of lawlessness will set himself up in the temple of God. And we read that in the English, and we say, well, there must be a rebuilt temple. There might be, but this verse does not say that. Here's the deal. There are two words in Greek that we translate into temple, but they have two different meanings. One of them is hieron, H-I-E-R-O-N. The other one is naos, N-A-O-S. Hieron and naos. Hieron means the big building on the temple mount, the structure. The naos means the holy place, the holy of holies behind the veil. The, the hieron simply serves as the house that that houses the holy place, the naos, okay? So those are two different words, and they mean two different things. So there's a, there's a Hebrew word that is a synonym of naos, and that Hebrew word is deber, D-E-B-I-R. It comes from the Hebrew word D-A-B-A-R, which means the word that God speaks in the beginning, he speaks it, and it creates because he speaks it. The deber means, it comes from debar, and it means the holy word place, the place where the word becomes flesh and dwells among us. That's, that's John chapter 1, okay? So that word in Hebrew would be dabar. All right, now with all of that, you don't have to memorize all this, folks. Just listen, because I'm gonna, when I hit the punch point of this in this ne- next segment, it's you're going to go, ah, I get it now. I see it now. Because Paul tells us, the Word of God tells us, it's crystal clear. And when you find out what Paul really said here in Second Thessalonians, I think it'll blow you away. Coming closer to finding out what the, to solve a mystery yeah, of yeah. the temple. Yeah. Well, I had to set up the context first yeah. and lay the foundation. It's the mystery of Second Thessalonians in chapter 2. And Carl's going to come back and make it relevant to where we are right now. Straight from the Bible. Look this is a relevant word with Pastor Carl Gallus. We'll be right back. For more on Pastor Carl or to listen to his podcast anytime, visit carlgallops.com. For more on Pastor Carl or to listen to his podcast anytime, visit carlgallops.com. Thank you for joining us for another edition of A Relevant Word with Pastor Carl Gallops of the Hickory Hammock Baptist Church in the Pensacola, Florida area. And we're learning one of the mysteries of the Bible that is a head scratcher. And yeah. Carl's going to make the second part of this relevant with the Second yeah. Thessalonians chapter two and all this temple business. Yeah, I, I'm going a little deeper. I'm, yeah, I'm going to scratch the itch and get rid of the itch. Yeah. We're going to find out what this is. And it's not that I'm so smart or I think I know everything. It's just that the word of God, and folks, you're going to see it. It answers it for us. It tells us clearly, black and white. The apostle Paul write, wrote almost half the New Testament, the most well-known rabbi in the history of the planet. And he writes, now, based upon everything I've already set up, in the last segment, I told you the Hebrew word, uh, a synonym for the Greek word of the holy of holies. And then I told you the Greek word for the temple structure itself. All right. Again, you don't have to memorize those words. Just understand there are two different words in Greek that are often translated in our English Bibles as temple. And that's where the confusion comes in. Because if you don't know which one it is, and most Christians don't, let's just face it, they don't have time to study Greek and Hebrew and, and the Greek synonyms and the Hebrew synonyms. And, but, but I've done that work for you. And now I'm going to show you. You can go back and check behind me and you'll see I'm, I'm right. And, and it's not that I'm right. The Bible's right. Paul's right. He knows what he's talking about. All right, now watch. In the New Testament, Paul only mentions the Hieron, which means the temple on the temple mount, he only mention, mentions it in one verse. It's mentioned twice in that same verse. Uh, but it is, um, it is, yeah, it's mentioned twice in that same verse. And that's in 1 Corinthians 9, 13 through 14. And I'm saying this so that you might want to jot those down. Uh, but here it is. It says, Paul says, don't you know that those who work in the temple, and the word is he around, that means the whole building structure, Solomon's colonnade, everything that's up on the temple mount. Don't you know that those who work in the temple Get their food from the temple. And by the way, that translation of those who work in the temple, the word temple is actually not in the, in the Greek there, I don't think. 
Uh, I think it, it, it speaks of uh, the temple service. But if it does, it speaks of the temple as the Heoron. And it says, and they get their food from the Heoron. That word is there, I know. And those who serve at the altar share in what is offered on the altar. He said, don't you know this? So there's his only time in all of the half of the New Testament he wrote where he uses the word Heoron. Every other time he uses naos, which means the Holy of Holies, the place behind the veil where the Ark of the Covenant is, inside, under the house of the Heoron that houses it. But Paul changes all of that because he understands what Jesus did on the cross, his resurrection, the birth of the church, uh, the the coming destruction of the temple that would be there for at least 2,000 years, no temple. We know because we're living 2,000 years the other side of it and there's no temple there. Paul knew all of that. So listen to what he says. I'm going to go in order. So 1 Corinthians, four times, four times, 1 Corinthians, he says, uh, chapter 4, verse 16 and 17, do you not know that you are God's temple? And the word there is naos. And that God's spirit dwells in you. If anyone destroys God's temple, naos, I'm going to just say naos, God will destroy him for God's naos is holy and you are that naos. Four times he says, we, we born again believers are now the new temple of God. It's the only place in the New Testament where a new temple is spoken of. And he does it again, even more directly in a moment. But in first Corinthians chapter four, verse 16 and 17, he says that very, very clearly. Don't you know you are the naos? The Spirit dwells in you. If anyone destroys the naos, God will destroy him, for God's naos is holy, and you are that naos. All right, 1 Corinthians chapter 6, verse 19 and 20. Do you not know that your body is the naos of the Holy Spirit who is in you, whom you have received from God? You are not your own. You are bought at your price. Therefore, honor God with your body. You are the naos. And listen, let's use that Hebrew uh, the synonym, the deber. It's used 16 times in the Old Testament, 10 times in 1 Kings. Five times in Second Chronicles, one time in Psalm 28, 16 times Deber is used for the equivalent of the naos. And, and so if you read it that way, here's what Paul says in 1 Corinthians 6, 19, 20. Don't you know that your body is the Deber of the Holy Spirit? And that word Deber, it means the holy word place. Your body is the holy word place. Come on down to 2 Corinthians chapter 6, verse 16. In what agreement is there between the holy word place of God and idols? For we are the holy word place of the living God. We who? We the church. We, God's born-again people. And the word is naos he uses. But see, in all of our English translations, every time I'm using the word deber or naos, deber being Hebrew, naos being Greek, it says temple in the English. That's what throws people off. It throws them off. They see this. See there, my Bible says there's going to be a temple on the temple mount. First of all, nowhere in the New Testament does it say those words. In the last days, there will be a third temple on the Temple Mount in downtown Jerusalem. Those words do not exist anywhere in the Bible. What happens is people come to 2 Thessalonians. Don't you know that the man of lawlessness will set himself up in the temple and proclaim that he's God? And so immediately we get a picture of our mind of some dude sitting on a big throne in a new temple on the Temple Mount. Except that's not what it says, number one. And number two, when you uncover the English word and get to the Greek word, the word there is naos. And Paul's already defining it, and I'm not even finished letting him define it. So now let's go to 2 Corinthians chapter 6, verse 16. What agreement is there, I think I just said this, between the naos of God and idols? For we are the naos of the living God. Yes. Now listen to Ephesians chapter 2, verse 21 and 22. So in Jesus Christ, the whole building, he's talking about the church, he says that earlier, is joined together and rises to become a holy naos in the Lord, a temple. And in, it says temple in English, but it says naos in his writing. And in him, you two are being built together to become a dwelling place in which God lives by his spirit. Well, now he's describing what the ancients thought that that holy of holy was. It was the place where God dwelt by his spirit and spoke to the people. That's why it was called the Deber, the holy word place. But it's gone now, and it's been gone, and Paul is saying, but now the church is that. Now we are that. He says it over and over. 1 Corinthians first, chapter 4, verse 16, 17. 1 Corinthians chapter 6, verse 19 and 20. He says it. 2 Corinthians chapter 6, verse 16. I just said that a moment ago. Twice he says it. Ephesians chapter 2, verse 21 and 22. He says it. And then the ninth time, he uses the word not it was nine times. He only uses he or run once. And that's in 1 Corinthians 9. The ninth time, 2 Thessalonians. Concerning the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ and our being gathered together to him, we ask you, brothers, 
not to become easily unsettled or alarmed by some prophecy, report, or letter supposed to have come from us saying that the day of the Lord has already come. Don't anyone deceive you in any way. Don't let anyone deceive you. For that day will not come until the rebellion occurs and the man of lawlessness is revealed, the man doomed to destruction. He will oppose and will exalt himself over everything, everything that's called God or is even worshipped, so that he sets himself up in the naos proclaiming himself to be God. Folks, listen to me. The only way that Paul ever uses or defines the word naos is for the church and and or for God's people. It's the only way. It's the only way he uses it. In fact, again, in 2 Thessalonians, when he uses it again, he says to the people, I've already told you this. I've told you this so many times. I've told you in other letters to other churches that you're preaching from your pulpits now. I've told you over and over, but I'm going to tell you again. This man of lawlessness, another word for the Antichrist, is going to set himself up in and amongst the church, in and amongst the hearts of the people that are in churches, and he's going to proclaim himself to be God in the last days. And that's when lawlessness is going to prevail over the face of the earth. That's when rebellions are going to happen all over the face of the earth. We're in the edges of that now. Jesus said the last days would be like the days of Noah, would be like the days of of, of Lot. And, and, and what he means is globally, see? I mean, this is the first generation because now of technology, 24-7, information, communication systems, the whole globe is now settled into nations and billions of people. And now we're communicating with each other in the new Tower of Babel, day and night, 24-7. We are translating languages. We're speaking in one language. And I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to say we got a taste of it during the COVID days. Now, listen, folks, this, this show is not about uh, disputing COVID. I'm not talking about vaccines and who should have gotten one, who didn't, or masks. or if, I just want to describe what happened and see if this doesn't kind of foreshadow what Second Thessalonians says. For the first time in history since the church was born, the whole world almost, with all the governments of the world, almost all of them, speaking with one voice because of internet, 24-7 communication information systems, and says, close the churches. Well, most of the churches all over the world closed. Pastors were put in jail. Some churches in some communist countries were bulldozed down. People were put in jail. Things happened. People were fined. In the United States, California had all kinds of, of, of melees over all of that. Pastors threatened to be put in jail. Churches closed down by orders under threat of taking the property or putting the pastors in jail. One of the pastors I'm broadcasting from Florida, one of the first pastors to actually be put in jail was a pastor from Tampa, Florida, Rodney Howard Brown Mega Church in Tampa. He had his church open during COVID, taking all kinds of precautions, advertising to people, you don't have to come, but if you want to come, we've got masks for you, we've got hand wash, you can plenty of room, you can sit apart, but you can come because we're not closing the churches. The county commissioners decided to pass an ordinance that if any church stayed open in Hillsborough County, they could put the preachers in jail. Well, that's illegal. I mean, that's just, that's lawlessness. But they did it. Rodney Howard Brown stayed open. They put him in jail. Governor Ron DeSantis stepped in and said, wait a minute, you don't have the authority to do that. As a matter of fact, I'm the governor. I'm the only one that can do this. And I'm declaring that no churches anywhere in Florida have to be closed. None. So let him out of jail. Not only did they have to let him out of jail, but they had to drop all charges. And people were frothing at the mouth because they thought, ah, we finally got a preacher in jail in the United States of America with a First Amendment in Florida with a very conservative governor. Now we've got him in jail because our county commissioners put him in jail. See, that's a taste of that spirit that Paul warned that was coming in the last days. And I'm not saying COVID was it or the worldwide closure of churches, but for the first time since the church is born, never worldwide have they been ordered to close. So the government's basically said, I am God. You will do what I say. You close the church. I'll tell you if you can open it, when you can open it, if you can sing, how long you can sing, how far you have to sit apart, and whether or not you have to have a vaccine before I let you back in your church. That is the spirit of what Paul was talking about. There may be a new temple on the Temple Mount one day, but that verse right there that everybody says says that, it does not say that. Paul never uses the word naos to talk about a temple on the Temple Mount. You always have a picture of... Of the evil man sitting on the big throne in the, in the big house on the hill. Yep. Not like this at all. It's not. When you know the word of God in context, you know the Hebrew words, the Greek words, and the context, it's not there. It's not there. And it's not my interpretation. That's what the Bible says. Mm-hmm. Thank you for sharing that, Carl. Thank you. This is A Relevant Word with Pastor Carl Gallops. May the Lord bless you and keep you always. Thanks for listening. Now more than ever, we need to listen to God. He still speaks through his word, the Bible. Each week, 
Pastor Gallups shares what the Word of God is saying, even now. A Relevant Word, with longtime pastor and best-selling author, Carl Gallups. To access Pastor Carl and to listen to his podcast anytime, visit carlgallops.com. Thanks for listening. Ladies and gentlemen, prepare yourself for a brand new book from critically acclaimed best-selling author, Pastor Carl Gallup's The Yeshua Protocol, an explosion of divine revelation for our unique generation. Carl Gallup's takes you on a whirlwind tour through the scripture like you've never experienced. Discover the undeniable Yeshua codes buried within the pages of the Old Testament. Learn the inescapable reality that every living cell in creation is encoded with the very name of God. And be shocked when you see what has been secretly lying within the pages of the Bible that allows you to see Yeshua as you've never before fathomed him. Yeshua Protocol mentions a wide variety of topics such as quantum physics, ancient Hebrew letter meanings, the latest archaeological finds, and Yahweh's name encoded upon our very own DNA. Do you really cover all of these topics in the book, The Yeshua Code? All of those and many more. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, we're living in incredible times. And, and you know, you speak of, for example, internet technology and all that that entails. You know, I describe it as we are looking at the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. 